You're looking at Gloucester Harbor. We're about 20 miles northeast of Boston. And on this granite outcropping sits Beauport. Now, this was the home of Henry Sleeper, and he was an early 20th century interior decorator and antiquarian. Today, it is looked after by the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities. Inside is a treasure house of antiques and decorative arts. Come on. Down here beneath the hand-hooked rug is a nice wide pine floor. And all of this sits in front of a beautiful walk-in fireplace. But this is the piece I wanted you to see. It's a settle. And this high back was a welcome feature on those cold winter nights to keep away the drafts. I've seen a lot of these, but I don't recall ever seeing one with a curved back like this. And look at how it's made. Random width boards with beads where they're joined, attached with simple nails. And the joinery couldn't be simpler, just a butt joint along this edge. Now I'd like to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely greatly reduces the possibility of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how I built today's project. But when it came time to build our prototype settle, I made a couple changes. One was to close in the bottom, and the other was to provide this access hatch. I did that for a couple reasons. Closing in the bottom made the settle a little more stable, and the access hatch gave me a nice storage area. Now, if you had this in front of a fireplace, you could store your kindling and fireplace accessories in there. Or if it was in a hallway, you might store boots and gloves and wintertime things. Now, to get started, I glued up some panels. Here's one for one of the sides. Here's another side panel. And this large panel is for the seat. Now, the first thing I want to do is scrape off the excess glue and lightly sand both sides. Now, the next thing I want to do with everything sanded is start to lay out the pieces to cut. And the first piece is the seat. Now, I was fortunate enough to make a cardboard pattern of the original. And it's real important because the back is curved. And a pattern like this is invaluable in doing layout. If you don't have a pattern, I can tell you that that back radius is 10 foot 8 inches. So what I've done here is basically set up a big T-square. The blank for the seat is up there. And I've set up this board with this edge being along the center line of the blank. Attached a nail right here, which happens to be exactly 10 foot 8 inches from where I want to lay it out. Using a string that won't stretch very much and simple pencil attached to the end, I can now lay out the radius. Well, now it's just a matter of shortening the string 14 and 7 eighths inches from the back line, and that'll give me the front arc. To lay out the side cut, the first thing that I do is make an equal measurement from the center line to each side along the back arc. Then take my string, which is like a spoke in a wheel, stretch it out, put it on the back mark, mark the front edge, and simply connect it with a straight edge. Now, before I actually cut out this seat blank, I want to point something out to you. Along the back, there are three more pieces with the same radius as that seat. This top member, this piece right here, and another piece that you can't see under the floor of the chest. Now, I suppose I could try to put all of those pieces together, four pieces of wood, and run them through the bandsaw. But I think the piece is a little too big, and it would be very awkward to put it through the saw. So what I'm going to do is use my jigsaw, my electric jigsaw, and... With this, I can only really cut two pieces, mainly because of the length of the blade. So what I've done is I've taken a piece of 1 by 10 and fastened it underneath the seat blank. In fact, it's a little bit longer. So that as I cut along my radius line, I'll end up with another piece. And this will actually become that top cross member. Now, there's still a few more arced cuts to make. And one of them is the inside edge of this top cross member. This member is two and three quarters inches wide. I suppose I could just use my jigsaw to make that cut, but the bandsaw makes a lot more sense since I have one in the shop. I'm going to show you a technique of why this works so well. First, I put a piece of tape on the rip fence. It's 90 degrees to the blade, and it's two and three quarters away. And the idea is to keep the outside of the arc in contact with that tape edge, and I'll end up with a piece that's two and three quarters the entire length.
not bad. Now I've got to make a piece that's four inches wide. Well, that takes care of all the curved pieces I need for the back of the bench. Now I need some for the front of the bench. There's two pieces, one up here at the top and one down at the bottom, to which I fasten these boards. Now the radius is again different because it's in two and three quarters inches. So what I'm going to use is the salvage from my front cutout of the seat. And here it is over here. This is the piece that's left over. And I fastened a couple boards together for the top and bottom cleat. I'll just set the salvage on the board. And using a compass, set it 2 and 3 sixteenths, the difference of that radius. I'll lay it out. And now I'll just cut both boards at once. Now's a good time to sand out the front edges of any of these curved pieces that show, like this top cleat or the seat. And to do that, I'm simply going to use my drum sander, which is set up in the drill press. Now, to trim the ends of both the seat and all the cross members, I'm just going to use my little lightweight circular saw. Next, I want to work on these sides, which have a very nice, elegant shape. A little curve at the top to a taper to a slight flat section, and then a nice little round over on the front here. Now, I've taken both pieces, the blanks, and fastened them together, laid out the shape of the side on one of the pieces. And the first thing I want to do is cut the width of this bottom piece. Oh, my panel cutter sure makes an easy job of squaring up the bottom. Now, the rest of the cuts are going to be done with my handheld jigsaw. Well, that takes care of the cutting and the sanding of the edges of our side pieces. Now I have to get ready to make a couple dados in those side pieces. I need two in each piece, one at the top for this cross member and one down here for the seat. Now, it's very important that you lay the pieces out in the right orientation because there are lefts and rights, insides and outsides. And the easiest way to do it is put them back to back. And I'm just going to put an X or a witness mark on the side that I want that dado for the seat. Now, over here at the table saw, I've set up my dado head cutter, which is just a wobble blade with carbide tips. And I've set the distance from the cutter to the fence at 15 and a quarter inches. And the depth is 3 eighths of an inch. So now I'll just plow out that dado. You might have noticed that I pushed that piece through very slowly. And that's so that I minimize any chipping that might occur because of the dado head. Now I have to join the two side pieces to this cross brace and the bottom shelf. Now here I'm going to use a technique known as biscuit joinery. And all I do is line up the piece where I want it, put a pencil mark on both pieces where I'm going to install these little beach biscuits. And what happens is these really swell up when you get some glue, so it's a very strong joint. Now, to make the slot for the biscuit to fit in, I use this biscuit joiner, which is a tool specifically designed to pivot and plunge this little saw blade so that it makes a half moon for the biscuit. Watch. Now I've installed a fence on the biscuit joiner. And what that does is allows me to hold the tool on the end of the cross pieces. And I just line up my pencil mark with the scribe mark on the tool and cut the slot. Well, now I've just fitted the sides to the seat. And that allows me to put a little mark right here where the seat meets the front edge. And I want to be able to knock off this corner, just like they did on the original. Before I do any assembly, there's one more operation I want to do. And that's to ease the front edges of this cross piece up at the top and on the seat. And to do that, I'm just going to use my router. And I've set it up with a quarter inch bit, but it's just barely sticking up. I don't want that full quarter round. I just want to kiss the edge and ease it just a little bit. Well, 
Well, now we're ready for some final assembly. And the first thing is to put some glue in that dado for the seat, just ordinary yellow carpenter's glue. And I like to take a brush and spread it out so that it's nice and even along all edges of the dado. Now we'll just slip it on, drive it together using my rubber mallet. Okay, now I'm ready to nail it together. Notice I've put a very light pencil line here, which is right in the center of the dado, so I can get the nails in the right place. You could nail it by hand, but I'm going to use the pneumatic nailers that we have here in the shop. And I'm just using a four-penny finish nail. A little bit of glue on the biscuits, and then I stick them in the side of our bench. And they'll join the side to the cross piece and the bottom. Now this is the part of the assembly that I have to move relatively quickly. I want to get good coverage of the glue on the ends of the boards and in the slots for the biscuits. At the same time, I want to get it all together before the glue sets up. Now first is this four inch cross piece, which I'm just going to try to get aligned with my biscuits. And I'm going to put one nail in this end to hold it in place. Now I'll take the bottom piece, and set that in this side. Lining up all those biscuits and just slipping it together. Like that and drive a nail in there. Okay, now I gotta come down this end and try to fit both of these pieces together at the same time. Well, you know, it doesn't take long for the glue to start swelling up these biscuits. Okay, and now I'll put a nail in from this side. Well, now a couple clamps to hold it all together while the glue sets up. And now I'm ready to put the top cross member in. A little bit of glue in the dados and some nails. But while the glue sets up, let's take a look at the back. Notice that the boards are random in width. Five inches, six inches, four inches, four and a half inches, and so forth down the line. Now over here, up against my lumber rack, are several boards for the one we're working on. Again, random widths. And let's look at some of the details. This board has two grooves. And the next board has two tongues, one on each edge, and beads, front and back, and on each edge. Because remember, this piece is going to be viewed from both sides. So now I'll show you how I made some of these pieces. I started out with number two pine, which gives me the knots that I wanted. But the surface of number two is a little imperfect, sometimes a little rough. It's meant to be painted and used outside. So you could sand all these pieces smooth, but what I like to use is my thickness planer. Take a 30 second off each side and you'll end up with a nice smooth surface to work with. Now the edges of the boards when they come from the lumber yard are plain to be fairly straight, but you can see there's some gaps. So before I go any further, I'm going to straighten the edges on my joiner. That looks pretty good. The next operation is to put a groove on each edge of every other board. And I'll use my router table to do that. I've set it up with a quarter inch slot cutter, a fence, and this feather board which holds the stock tightly down to the table. And I'll end up with a groove about 5 sixteenths of an inch deep on each edge. I've made an adjustment. I've lowered the slot cutter so that by making two passes, I end up with a tongue, which is going to fit right in that groove. One final operation I'll do over here on the table saw. Remember that each piece that has a tongue on each edge gets a bead. And that bead comes in about like this on both sides and both edges. Well, you know, I think that's enough for today. I'm happy to say that overnight, the clamps did their job, the glue is set up, and we're ready to continue. I want to go back over to the prototype and show you this board down here. It's a five inch board bent around the back of the frame, and I think it's there for looks more than anything else, just like on the original. One thing I want to do is back bevel that board slightly so that when the vertical boards come down and meet it, I'll have a tight joint right on this face. 
Well, I'll use my joiner to back bevel it. And what I've done is tip the fence this way, about two and a half degrees. That's all I really need. And I'll just run it through. Well, here's the tricky part, trying to bend the board around the back of the frame. Now, I'm not going to try to start exactly even with the side. I'm going to leave it a little long and trim it off later. First thing is to apply a little glue, maybe only about a foot on the back for now, just to get it started, and some along the edge. I'm going to have to clamp this in place. Now, that's pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is use a few screws, because there's going to be a lot of force trying to come back on this piece. So what I'm going to do is just drill a hole down into the side frame. Counterboring it slightly, and I'll plug those later. And just put one, three screws along this edge, inch and five-eighths in each screw. With one end secured, I can now put the rest of the glue along the cross pieces. Well, now I'll just use some clamps to pull it tightly against the cross members. Okay, and now a couple nails for good measure. And now just a couple screws on this end to secure it. Well, this seems to be secure, so now I can remove the clamp. And I'll square a line, cut it off, trim it just a little bit long. Well, now I'll just put some pine plugs in these holes, and when they're dry, I'll sand them off. Now I'm ready to start putting on the vertical boards. Now I will glue the first one along the edge of the side, just so that I end up with a nice tight fit. So a little glue. Set the board tight to that horizontal piece and flush with the side, and I'll nail it in with some four-penny finish nails. Now I'll attach the rest of the boards. This last board, I'm just going to slip it in place and mark it at the bottom and at the top. And now I'll rip it to the widest width, and after it's installed, I'll belt sand any excess. Now, just as with the back, these pieces are secured with four penny finish nails. Well, now all that's left to do is cut the hatch in the seat. Now, this one is a little tough. Now, this is a piece of inch and a half brass plated piano hinge that I cut from a longer piece. I'm just temporarily fastening it to the seat with a couple screws so that I can use it as a gauge because I'm going to have to plane the back of the seat until I get this front edge to align. Perfect. Now I'll secure the hinge for good. Well, that takes care of the woodworking. Now, if this was your piece, how would you finish it? To stain this piece, I've chosen a honey maple stain. Now, this is a water-based product. It's a little bit thicker when it goes on, almost like a paint, I guess. But the thing that I like about it is that it seems to stain this pine very evenly. Now, after you put it on and let it set for a little while, the way you even it out is just to use a rag that's been dampened with water, and you just rub it until it's nice and even, and you get the color effect that you want. And after this dries, I'm going to put two coats of my water-based satin polyurethane on it. The thing that I like about these water-based finishes is I can put on my stain and my two coats of polyurethane all in one day. Well, with a nice cushion, a roaring fire, and a good book, what else could you ask for?